the universe. Well, this video will be again just about uh, the Austrian Bundesliga and we will not be talking a whole lot about the games that were happening over the past two weeks. I was actually, I did not want to do any video on uh, Germany slash Austria. I will not talk about the German league. It's all Austrian shirts. Most of the last shirts are behind me. But there were two big events that I think deserve <laughs> to be covered. Both of them are not very happy, although I think one is the celebration of a coach that I do consider among the top three coaches to ever work in Austria. Uh, and that was pure luck. I think um, in another time, this guy would have been uh, working for bigger teams, uh, I would say, especially in France and would have been considered as one of the greats. Uh, but it's also a little bit of a sad story, but I think we definitely need to talk about uh, Ivica, or Ivan, Ivica Ozem, Ozim, who passed away on the 1st of May, exactly on the 113th birthday of the team that he became so famous for in Austria, Sturm Graz. And I was always almost about to put for the first time ever the jersey of another Austrian team on me just to honor him. Um, and then something happened today that is just uh, with my team Lusk and hence I'm wearing Lusk where you just wonder, sometimes it is really, really, really hard to be a fan of this team. Really, 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 really hard. If you've been following my videos, you know that I was not happy with the way things were going, that there was kind of this negative spiral in, in there. I never want to be in favor of uh, firing coaches, but I think it seemed inevitable, um, given especially that there was now, due to the cup final, there's almost a one and a half week break, uh, or almost two week break, uh, to give the team a little bit of a jolt, maybe get a new manager in until the end of the season. Oh, and then they hire this guy. Then they hire this guy. Dietmar Kübauer, former Rapid legend, former Rapid player, uh, who as a player and as a coach has been nothing but antagonizing Lusk and the Lusk fan base. A player, to be fair, not the only one. I mean, he's basically antagonizing everyone that is not Rapid or Mattersburg, who don't exist any, any, anymore. A player that is just, I think, the best way to describe him as a rat. He is the new coach of Lusk, and I will talk about it. To me, this is like declaring bankruptcy on a great project. To me, this ends the latest uh, golden period of Lusk. Probably the best, second best ever period uh, in their lifetime. It's, it's over. It's over. With disappointment, all bets are off. But yeah, I think to understand the whole thing, uh, we gotta talk a little bit about the results. And you know, again, I go a little bit uh, backwards. Let's first say Salzburg win the cup final 5 0, another double, blah, 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 blah. Congr congratulations to uh, an underdog story. Uh, we do have to talk a little bit about what happened on the week before, so Tuesday, it's almost a week ago already. It is a week ago already that I'm sure shooting have any walking in more than a week, a week ago. Um, Lask losing 4-0 to Wattens. Uh, a game, Wattens was the team that we beat at the start of relegation around 6-0, a team that was relegation threatened, now finds themselves in first place. Only the results of Ried against Admiravaka 1-1 and Hartberg uh, beating Alta, who now look in real danger, keep Lask in second spot here. But it is a really, really tight spot. We'll look at the table uh, in, a, in, in a sec. On the bottom, um, uh, the two Vien Viennese teams only managed draws against the Corinthian op opposition Sturm Graz against a team, a Salzburg team that just won the championship, championship celebrating and focusing on the cup final, of course. They win 2-1 and are now fixed in second place. So congratulations to Sturm Graz. You actually would deserve to be higher up after this just because I don't have a black Sturm jersey that I didn't switch those two around. So uh, that uh, is a great achievement for Sturm Graz. 
So, and uh, looking at the table, you see already, I mean, as I said, one, 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 two in Austria are settled. Um, it is basically now all about uh, the uh, third spot will give you the Europa League, then conference, league, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it is a three way tussle for that spot and so on. And on the bottom, seven and eight will go in the conference league playoff. The Mines, Tirol and Lusk, however, Lusk, whoever wins the league has a home field advantage. So just to say that. And I heard it yesterday in the evening, already the rumors that uh, Lusk is going uh, to fire the coach. And I think everyone was just ready to have this done. Because coach Wieland has been not only overall rather underwhelming, but he is also largely responsible uh, for getting beloved manager, at least among the fan base. I'm not sure about the team itself, but he was a beloved manager, uh, manager Valerian Ismail, who basically put Lusk to the highest glory, this glory run in 2019-2020 in the Europa League. Uh, he got him fired by uh, really denouncing him internally. He did kind of the same thing now with uh, Dominic Talhammer, kind of undermining him. He has been, and I don't know why, uh, he's also kind of responsible with his appointment, suddenly Jürgen Werner, who was the mastermind behind the rise of Lusk. He didn't want to work with him. And so it's only the president who, yeah, Pinkgate, we have that as well who is starting to really antagonize the fan base. And this was a fan base that was lying on his feet because he salvaged a team from bankruptcy that was dead, that was brought out. I read obituaries that, that this might be the last, uh, last game that Lusk will ever play. So bad it was in 2013. They salvaged it. Everything financially and so on looks good, but on a sporting level, on a personal level, it is an absolute disgrace what is currently happening at Lusk. And now the appointment of Dietmar Kübauer is for me absolute sporting bankruptcy. I think that with Wieland, newly appointed sporting director Vujanovic, a who as a player is an absolute star, he got us out of the third division. He, even the first leagues, he was scoring goals like crazy. He will always be for his, um, the way he conducts himself will always be a fan favorite as a player. However, hiring him as a sport, sporting director who has only worked, I think, in the fourth division tier team before. And then his first window, yes, it's only his first window, but uh, he needed to prove himself already there. The only thing he did is, is extend it without need, without real need, extended the contract of the coach, Andreas Wieland. And to, to be honest, until the end of the season, prove yourself further. I was fine with that. It was a little bit underwhelming because I was hoping for a new name already. But I would have given him at most, yeah, no, we extend him for at least, I think, another season. So now that you fire him, you have to, of course, pay him off. And now they do the same mistake with Didi Kübauer. I mean, I hear now that the, there were two other candidates uh, in Peter Stöger, who didn't want to, and Markus Schopp, who, you know, uh, first was a hardback and uh, then a fire at Barnsley who also wasn't uh, seemingly not in, in interest, although I think I would have liked Markus Schropp because uh, since we've been buying regularly a player from Hartberg, he actually would have already had an in with the team. Uh, and of course Feldhofer, who signed with Rapid, that, that would have been a good appointment as well, but you know, uh, you missed the train on that one by uh, being slow in many ways. I, I, I think the way this season is just so... And now you hire Didi Kuba, who had just been, it was a, it was a surprise when he was fired with Rapid uh, in winter. Because it was not going as badly, but to be honest, he is one of the most hated figures. If you're not a Rapid fan, he is one of the most hated figures in Austria. He just riles everyone up. He goes under your skin. Now, this might actually be play, uh, pay no, uh, go now in favor of Lusk in many ways because everything, the riling up that he hears he doing against us, he's doing now to the others. He's constantly in the referee's mind. But he is so, so such a, I mean, I do 
get at times um, the humor and so on. But every time I see him, my hair stands up and I'm going, girl, and now this idiot is the coach of my beloved team. This is the, uh, I was trying, 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 trying to think what were, what were the biggest WTF uh, coaching hires that I can ever remember. And I think the only one that comes to mind is Hans Krankel and that was actually, uh, it's kind of all right because it was only until the end of the season to save them from re relegation travel, I think in 2009. 2010 or something like that. 2010 it must have been. But this is the biggest WTF hire that I can remember. And for me, and um, I would even under, I would probably understand it if I would see that he is using a playing style that is akin to what Lask has been doing. No, he's there is no such thing. All this nice development that we've been taking over the last few years. Yes, it has been a little bit derailed, but I think the players are there to play a, mo a modern pressing style. All gone with Dietmar Kuba. It will be all fight, 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 fight. And so it goes downhill. The stadium is growing nicely. All four sides are already closed. It will be opened in about a year or so. That would be great. But to see Dietmar Kuba as the last coach, and he has a steep hill to climb because there will be no patience given to him from the fan base. And the fan base is already up in arms over the pink jersey, and not because of the color pink, but this color pink is associated with the sponsor and they really, really don't like it that everything is pinkified with Lusk. As much as I'm in favor of embracing uh, the pink color, as you know, this is Lusk's I do understand a little bit where this is coming from, especially after the Red Bull Tetego, where the beautiful purple and white have been replaced with red and white. Um, so yeah, absolute, absolutely. I mean, sometimes you wonder how can it be? And this comes on the heel of me being so excited about the Ralf Rangnick appointment and on the general uh, happiness about what's happening with my other favorite team, Milan. Of course, there needs to be always one huge black spot. And now it feels again, as I think I said three or four or four or four or four years ago when Lask was up and Milan was down, well, even three, yeah, three, two years ago, I said the two teams have completely switched. Now it's totally back to the old feeling. This is how I have been feeling for most of my footballing life. Milan, top, Lask. Yeah, I need Milan to kind of stay sane. Now, Let's go to something else, uh, Ivica Osim. Uh, I'm sure not many of you will know him, but as I said, I think he's one of the greatest coaches, um, but also most unknown coaches out there. Even as a player, he was a great uh, player for the Yugoslavian national team, the one that made it all the way to the Euro final in 1968. Uh, where they lost on a little bit controversial circumstance to, to Italy, who were hosting the tournament. He was in the best team. He was an elegant player. Uh, he played most of his time in his hometown, Sarajevo, for uh, Jeljesnitsar. Uh, there, so um, that's his hometown. This is where he grew, he, he grew up. He um, was uh, even on his final game uh, for uh, Jeljesnitsar. Jeljesnicar. This is a very difficult <laughs> word to say for someone who doesn't speak uh, the language. Uh, I think it's Jeljesnicar. Jeljesnicar. Uh, Jeljesnicar. I get there. Um, he actually, they had a game in 1970 against Santos, of course with Pelé. Uh, and uh, the, fav the, uh, the big story is that Ozim, who was the star of the team, couldn't play and seemingly Pelé said, no, if Ozim is not playing, I'm not playing. So they got uh, Ozim on the field, played him and afterwards he, uh, even Pelé, Pelé gave him his jersey, not the other way around. So it uh, tells you a lot about his time as, as a player. This then took him in his late uh, uh, career to France, where he played uh, for Strasbourg, saint and Valenciennes. Um, at Strasbourg, he was a teammate of Arsene Wenger, where he had a, a close relationship with for, the, for most of his life. Uh, and also, and this will be important, with an Austrian called Heinz Schilcher. 
uh, that he struck up a relationship. Upon finishing his career, he's most well known internationally for um, coaching the y Yugoslavian national team from 1986 to 1991. Now, uh, he failed to qualify for the Euros in 1988, but this was an eight-team Euros, so this was not easy, but easily qualified for Italia 90, where his team containing uh, players like Stojkovic, Jan Poznetsko, Pancev, a star-studded team, absolutely star-studded team, on the ascendancy, a team that made it to the quarterfinals where they got to eventual finalists, Argentina, to a penalty shootout and lost there despite playing most of the time um, with a few, uh, with, with, with a man uh, less. So uh, absolute uh, big achievement right there. And you saw that this young Yugoslav team is an up and coming team. A team that cruised through qualifying. And I was very well aware of that because Austria played in the qualification group with Denmark and Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia cruised to that Euros. Absolutely eased into that one. They were a brilliant team to watch. Probably one of the most talented sides in Europe at that time. But you know what happened. You absolutely know what happened. Yes, the war in Yugoslavia broke out. And upon shelling of his hometown in um, Sarajevo, Ozim stepped down uh, as the Yugoslav national team coach, uh, basically saying that uh, you know what happened in my hometown. This team does not deserve to go to the Euros. And uh, he then later, and this is probably the saddest thing because my abiding image of Osim is a very successful coach, a very emotional coach, but not a smiling coach. He said that this war um, took away his smile. Absolutely. Now, uh, after being uh, a, a coach of the Yugoslav national team, he actually coached Partizan Belgrade, then went to Panathinaikos um, uh, there. But he always wanted to be closer to home. Uh, and through his friend Heinz Schilcher, he was hired for mid-table team Sturm Graz in 94-95. A team that uh, just escaped bankruptcy, where uh, they got a president who was willing to splurge the cash Giannini, for instance, uh, often against the will of his coach. And Heinz Schilke was the manager of this team and he ra rang up his friend Ivica Osim saying, you know, not only is Graz kind of close to former Yugoslavia, but it's kind of in a stable place as well and you can be here. And for the rest of his life, um, outside of a stint uh, in Japan, uh, he was actually living in Graz. And he got this young Sturm Graz team, a team that never has done amounted to anything. I think there was uh, they had one second place, uh, blah blah blah. There, there, you know, a few things here and there. But over Sturm Graz were a little bit like Lask without the one title. He made this team with a refreshing offensive style of football into the most talked about side in uh, Austria. For sure. This was a team that clinched and uh, championship in 98, I think, with eight or nine games to spare in a 10 team league. Uh, they were just brilliant that season. Near, um, near unbeatable. And I know it because I've been there. It started with, uh, I think, um, uh, nah, it, uh, they had a cup win at one point. Then uh, they won the league, I want to say, in 98, exactly. 98, they won, uh, 97, 98, they won the league at a canter. Then in 999, they, they repeated with a double against Lask uh, in the cup final as well. Uh, that was one team. Uh, there they were not the better side, I would say, at that time. But other than that, this was an amazing team. It was also the backbone of the Austrian national team in a way if the coach uh, Herbert Braske would have a little bit more relied on these players, especially the Magic Triangle with Hannes Reinmeier, uh, Ivica Vastic and Mario Haas, who all were eligible to play for Austria. Ivica Vastic, of course, uh, uh, the outstanding player in there. Um, 
it didn't continue with the champ championship because then was the rise of Tyrol, uh, who you know also they uh, they won three in three in a row. But after the third third title amongst the manager like Yogi Löw, then uh, the license got taken away from Waverman that they were thrown down. So maybe uh, he, they would have won probably second or uh, title title as well. But what's more more importantly, they had three Champions League appearances in a row, and on the third one, uh, the first two it was kind of roughish, but on the third one. This was a time where there were two group stages, they survived. They won their group, although twice losing 5-0 away from home against the Rangers and against Monaco, but they won that group. And they moved on to the second group stage, uh, which I think in recent times, yes, the, while I've been watching, there were a, a UEFA Cup final and a Cup winners Cup final for our Austrian teams. Uh, but this is one of the more outstanding achievements there because that Champions League uh, format was not geared towards small teams. Unfortunately, he, uh, President Kartnik could, did not take this. It was always a hate-love relationship. And unfortunately, uh, he had to step down in 2002, which ended a huge uh, era for Sturm Graz. And they then went to a really, really tough phase. Um, um, so yeah, it was an ugly departure. Let's put it that way. He then went to uh, Japan, where he went to Jeff United, or JF United. Uh, I think he got a cup win with them too. And there was even a point, a uh, Japanese uh, national team coach uh, after the World Cup in 2006. Fortunately, he had a stroke and needed to end this appointment as well, because uh, I would have been very interesting what he would have done with the Japanese national team. He then went back to Graz, where he has been living and where he died exactly, as I said, on the 1st of May, 22 which was the 113th birthday of Sturm Graz. Rest in peace, Ivica Osim. Um, yes, you're not associated with my team, but having such a person, he was a huge personality. He was kind of this philosopher. Uh, he had the team play brilliant football and he was just, um, you know, he he was he had just a personality and appearance that you don't uh, see very often, and of course always this kind of sad face as well. So yeah, I want to end this video probably with the weirdest title ever, outrage and obituary. But yeah, that's what what I needed to get off my chest. Any case, let me know what you think about all these. I especially would like to like, know if you've heard about Ivica Osim, because I think he is very well a personality if you like football that is worth look looking into and I still think if that Yugoslav national team would have played at, at the US they would have made a deep run this was a brilliant team this was the backbone of this team went with Croatia to the semi-final in 98 and they were in their prime Savicevic was playing for the team too yeah pretty brilliant team any case Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to my channel if you want to see more and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might actually enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and also hit the little bell icon so that you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day.